met the highest point on Squirrel Hill. Wind was whistling, whistling a song my heart obeys. At the highest point on Squirrel Hill, I am counting backwards. I suppose I'm counting back the days. From the highest point on Squirrel Hill. So today's show, as it came together, it, it came together in unexpected ways and, and strange symmetries. Uh, I think, have arisen from the two books that we're going to be talking about today. The first of them is Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting in the Soul of a Neighborhood by Mark Oppenheimer, who's been on this show many, many times. Uh, just reading the subtitle, you you know that we're going back to 2018, October 27th of 2018. Uh, the anniversary is, I guess, eight days away, uh, if you're listening live today on the 19th. Um, and then the second book we'll talk about uh, is mostly located uh, in the years from 1942 to 1944 um, and, and is about, in fact, the purging of Jews from a, a small village uh, and the, a number of whom were able to escape into the forest uh, and uh, a fraction of those were able to survive the process of living uh, pretty much exposed in the forest for all those months and years. Um, but it's also, it spills into other parts, other parts of time, and it it uh, it shows up in Connecticut. Um, but I guess I've, what I'm really saying here, though, is that there are ways in which the trauma kind of reaches its hand out from, from 1943 to 2018 uh, and, and joins hands uh, with the, the nearer present. And there are just odd little echoes, too, ranging from the bush belt to just the act of hiding in a small, dark place, hoping not to be found. That is very much uh, a part of both of these stories. But there's many other things to be said as well. And I'll stop talking and get the guest going on this. Uh, we begin, as I say, with Mark Oppenheimer. He's been on this show many, many times uh, in many, many capacities. Senior editor at Tablet, where he hosts the podcast Unorthodox, where I have been honored to be the Gentile of the week uh, on two occasions. He's the author of five books, most recently of Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting, and The Soul of a Neighborhood. He will be, if you're listening live on Tuesday, I know a lot of people podcast this show, but if you're listening live on Tuesday, he will be in the Odyssey Bookshop at South Hadley, Massachusetts tonight uh, at 7 p.m. for a book reading, questions, and signing. So, uh, I don't know. I think I'm going to – I usually call you Oppie, but I feel like this is a you slightly more – Okay. Well, let's go. I'll call you Oppie Definitely then. Definitely call me Oppie. And, and by the way, yeah. if you become a Gentile of the Week a third time on our podcast, you get a free circumcision if you want one. <laughs> I already have one. Um, already so, have, that okay. Would, well, you know. Uh, think of something else. Someone else. No, you, but, you know what you know, I want? I want uh, – the, like the thing that holds the yarmulke on your head, because one of the things I've talked about in your podcast is like when I go to a, a, yeah. a bar or a bat mitzvah, the yarmulke like falls off my head seven times while I'm sitting it's just, there. It's just a basic hair clip, but I'll, I'll yeah. send you some. All right. Yep. That's good. Um, so um, I guess maybe we have to very well, – this is not a conversation or really a book about the, the massacre itself. It's really about something else. But we may have right. to remind people what happened uh, on that day. So do that quickly. Sure. Um Thank you for having me. Good, good, good to be back. I also want to say I'll be in Hartford. I think this Saturday for Lit Fest or oh, like Real Art Ways. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be cool too. Um, October twenty seventh, two thousand eighteen, a gunman entered the Tree of Life Synagogue building in uh, Squirrel, the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh at the corner of Shady and Wilkins Avenues. And um, of the twenty two people inside, the alleged gunman he has not gone to trial yet, but uh, you know he was caught and shot himself in the act and injured by uh, by police. So I think they got the right guy. Uh, of the 22 people inside, he killed 11 and badly wounded two others and then also wounded several police officers who uh, responded. So it, uh, with 11 dead, it immediately became the deadliest anti-Semitic attack on North American soil ever um, before, during American history or pre-American history. There's never an, an instant where so many Jews were killed at once in uh, the United States. And, um, you know, it, the, what, what intrigued me was 
less the question of the killing, which immediately I think became very, very important to uh, a lot of people, principally, but not only Jews around the world, but the neighborhood itself, uh, Squirrel Hill, which is one of the oldest, maybe the oldest, substantively Jewish, uh, stable Jewish neighborhood in American history. It's been about a third Jewish, give or take, since World War I, which was around the time that that neighborhood was populated and, and settled out as, as the settlement from the heart of Pittsburgh kind of spread over time. So I was very curious how this old, tight-knit, geographically and spiritually cohesive Jewish neighborhood responded to the aftermath of the attack. It, it was a, a curiosity for me, not only because I'm interested in neighborhood and Jewish neighborhood and other kinds of neighborhood, but also because my father is from Squirrel Hill and he was the third generation of his family to be from Squirrel Hill. So it had a, a personal resonance as well. You know, one of the things that I guess I had not grasped at the time, um, maybe because I didn't read in enough detail at the time, was, and, and this will be the last time we talk about him at all, but um, the thing that attracted this killer, the, the kind of honey that attracted this fly, oddly enough, was in many ways the open heartedness uh, of one of the groups that was represented, whose activities were represented there in that building. The building, it turns out, first of all, housed three different uh, Jewish congregations, but one of them was involved uh, in, in, in refugee work. Uh, and, and in a way, it's like the open heartedness of these people. Uh, who were reaching far outside their own uh, their own boundaries to to help other people. That's what they right. paid a big price for. Yeah, it's it's really heartbreaking. As you noted, there were three congregations that met inside that building, and all of them lost members. So Tree of Life, which is the synagogue that owns the building and is the the landlord congregation, and then they had extra space, partly because their own congregation has dwindled over the years. So they, at the time, were renting space to two other congregations, Dor Hadash, which means new generation, and a, and a conservative congregation called New Light. And all three of the congregations lost members, had victims on that day. And yes, one of them, Dor Hadash, had participated uh, a bit earlier, a couple, a week or two or three, I forget, earlier in the National Refugee Shabbat, the Sabbath in honor of refugees, which was being sponsored at many, many synagogues across the country by HIAS, H-I-A-S, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which began 100 years ago or more as an organization to help Jewish uh, refugees resettle or settle in the United States. And today, there are very few Jewish immigrants to the United States, so it, it works with immigrants of all different populations. And it's a, a pro-immigrant group. It's the group that settled Sergey Brin, who went on to found Google, who has been a supporter of it, as well as many, many, many other people of all different ethnicities who have wanted to come to this country. And yes, the killer, alleged killer, had seen on the web that Hyas had sponsored something that had happened at the Tree of Life building through one of the member congregations. He just saw that address and said, well, that's where I'll go kill Jews. And that's how he found them. So if you have an abiding fascination with neighborhoods and particularly with neighborhoods that are heterogeneous and, and, and heterodox, uh, as well as containing very powerful statements uh, of ethnicities. I've watched you from the back seat of my car give a tour of Westville where you live and read your yep. article praising it. And, and there's a way in which there's something about that, right? The, this kind of walkable space uh, that contains uh, all kinds of human opportunities that uh, that fascinates you. And yes, your father's from Squirrel Hill, but there's something else going on here, right? You're yeah. seeing something that's meaningful to you. Yeah, I mean, it might be that I see something that's meaningful because my father's from Squirrel Hill and my mother is from West Mount Airy in Philadelphia and Oppenheimer's and Kirshner's just seem to keep going to these places that are kind of mid-sized, kind of first ring suburbs, not in the sense that they're politically, uh, that they have political, you know, that they have boundaries that are suburban, but the old term that they're outside the central central herb. Um, so Westville in New Haven is is a suburb in the sense that it's not the city core. It's a first ring neighborhood. Originally, these were um, these were streetcar suburbs, right? So if you think of something like Brookline in Boston, it was basically the outer edge of where the streetcar would take you, so that you could commute into a job in the center of the city. And as you got farther from the center of the city, the you got a little more land. You had an eighth of an acre or a quarter acre. You could have a house. You could have a little bit of private property and independence and park a car. But you were still tightly wound, bound up with everyone else. You you still could hear your neighbors fight. Maybe you shared a party line on the phone in the 1930s or 40s or 50s. You bumped, you, you shopped in a central district. So you were bumping into people at the market, at the post office. 
basically it's what we think of as walkable neighborhoods. And there's a lot of research done by people more qualified than I am that shows that these, this scale, this human scale is very, very good for human flourishing. So I was very curious what happens when the worst thing that can happen to a neighborhood happens, but it happens to one of the best neighborhoods. Right. Squirrel Hill is about as pleasant a place to live as you can imagine. It's got all the amenities. It's got the public library and the post office and the schools and the synagogues and the churches and the butcher and the baker, literally, all within a square two or three miles. So what happens when the most unpleasant thing comes to a place that, that has built into it a kind of pleasance, a kind of resilience and happiness to it? And what I found is just a lot of really extraordinary human interest stories because people are living in this kind of proximity to each other. Right. And I think one point you make kind of early on in the book, and, and forgive me if I, I don't describe this perfectly, but you, that in many respects, the immigrant experience in America is the enclave, which then disperses. It disperses to the suburbs. You know, it's usually an urban ethnic enclave. It disperses to the suburbs. It gets into a, a greater state of, of uh, heterogeneity. Um, that Squirrel Hill, in a way, defies a little bit of this, right? That it's it really kind of uh, kept a lot of the kinds of people who, in other geog geographical locations, just didn't stay, you know, in, in that kind uh, of environment. That's right. I mean, Jewish neighborhoods, any ethnic neighborhood that existed 75 years ago probably is not that ethnic neighborhood anymore, right? Southie in Boston is not principally old Boston Irish anymore. Um, Little Italy in New York is just, the only thing Italian about it left anymore is some restaurants. Mm. So, and this is, this is, it's a little less true of some Chinatowns, interestingly, um, but still, basically, there's a reason for this, which is immigrant groups, they move here, uh, not because they want to live in crowded conditions <laughs> on top of each other and work in restaurants and, and uh, you know, garment factories, but because they want to do that for one generation. They want their kids to get professional degrees or start their own businesses. And then they want to move to places where they can have a little more land and two cars in their garage and a pool. And so what's interesting about Squirrel Hill is that the Jewish neighborhood there, which in so many other cities had left its ancestral neighborhood, whether urban or, or gently suburban, but they left it to move even farther out into, into the woods, into the far suburbs. Um, in Squirrel Hill, they, they stayed. It has stayed, it has held a lot of Jews over generations, over a century. And this was the result not only, nobody knows why. That's what's so interesting is you ask people why, why does Squirrel Hill stay Jewish? And again, only about a third Jewish. It's not majority Jewish. And nobody knows. Some people say, well, it's because it's nestled in between these two parks, Frick and Shenley, and people just feel kind of caressed in the bosom of the city and they don't want to leave. Some people say, well, once you get outside Squirrel Hill, the traffic into the city is too terrible. But it's not terrible. Bostonians and San Franciscans put up with much worse traffic to live in the suburbs. Um, frankly, a lot of it is there was a very intentional effort by, um, by urban planners in the Jewish community to keep the resources in Squirrel Hill. They knew that, for example, that if they moved the JCC, the Jewish Community Center, out to the suburbs, that Squirrel Hill was done for, that then any new Jews moving to town would settle in the suburbs. But if you refurbish the JCC that's in the east end of Pittsburgh, then it kind of plants a flag and says this is still an okay place for Jews to be. So this was partly luck, but it was partly intentional. Can I make one more point about heterogeneity and homogeneity? Yes. Colin. So it's interesting because even as you and I talk about it, we trip over the fact that our, our minds are doing this thing where on the one hand, we know that diversity is supposed to be good. We're all supposed to want diversity. On the other hand, we also know that ethnic neighborhoods are good. We're supposed to want Jews or African-Americans or Latinos or Chinese to hold on to their ethnic neighborhoods because the alternative is that they're gentrified. They either become slums or they get gentrified, right? Mm. <laughs> and we like the idea that a neighborhood can retain its ethnic character. But those two things are intention, right? For a neighborhood just to remain, you know, Little Italy um, or Chinatown is to say that it's basically staying relatively homogeneous, that they're not allowing in that many outsiders and that the insiders aren't fleeing. On the other hand, we're all supposed to say we want every neighborhood to look like America. And the reality, of course, is that people like some of both, that to a lot of people, there's something a little bit off about living in a neighborhood that is totally heterogeneous, where all your neighbors are of different ethnicities and different experiences. And even though we're supposed to love that, that, I mean, Robert Putnam at Harvard has studied this, that can actually be a stressful way to live uh, in sort of total heterogeneity. We like having some people who are like us. Um, 
And so we like to balance that with a core of homogeneity of saying there's enough people around me who have my experience, again, whether it's the black experience, the Jewish experience, whatever, that I feel a kind of sense of, of comfort. And take it away from race for a moment, look at it with politics, right? Most of the liberals or conservatives I know, pick your flavor, don't actually want to live in a truly diverse neighborhood, right? Most of the blue state liberals I know don't think, wow, I live in this blue bubble. It'd be great if some Trump supporters moved in. <laughs> they actually like are comforted by their bubble. And they might want their neighbor to be 10% diverse from them, but they don't want it to be 50-50. And so there's this endless dance that goes on where we have these warring impulses between both cherishing diversity, but also feeling comforted by a bit of homogeneity. All right. I have something else I want to say about this, but I'm also on a tight clock that is being Sorry, uh, con controlled ran by the, over the NPR clock. Well, no, it's you ran it over the Betsy Kaplan clock, which is a much more serious <laughs> clock. NPR clock, you can easily blow off. The Betsy Kaplan clock, there are consequences, Mark. Uh, all right. So we have to take a quick break. So we'll come back. I, I want to finish out this part of the conversation. As I walk this wicked world, searching for light in the darkness of insanity. We're talking to Mark Oppenheimer about his book, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting and the Soul of a Neighborhood. We should say that the version of uh, What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding that you heard going out was recorded by a Pittsburgh man called the Clarks as part of the relief money uh, after the Tree of Life massacre. Um, so I, I just we're not going to have enough time. And I just want to say, first of all, this is a terrific book. And I'm not saying that just because we're friends. Um, and it's very, oh, very compellingly readable. And it's it, because these human stories, so many people that you talk to and, and their, their human stories are so compelling. And just to sort of button on to what we were saying before, I think there are other kinds of heterogeneity. And one of the kinds of heterogeneity that I pick up from this book is you have a, a community, yes, that was, as you say, you know, intended to, to continue. A, a, a lot of Jews and a lot of um, uh, of activities around that, but you also have an awful lot of Jews who are individually navigating, navigating and negotiating their identities, you know, what it means to be observant, what it means to be not observant. You know, by the end of the book, we have a guy who, you know, has 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 made an affirmative effort post Tree of Life to start wearing a yarmulke in public, which is kind of very counter to what his identity had been before. There's a way in which some of the heterogeneity exists within the Jewish community as each person says, what did it mean to be Jewish before this? And how has that changed after this? And maybe you could say more about that or even give an example or two. Yeah. If you want. I mean, I think one, absolutely one of the things I've always thought about as I've written about religion and, you know, like you, I got my start as a religion reporter um, is that, you know, secular people, people who don't spend a lot of time with religious people or talking about them or to them. They have this idea that they're all kind of on the same page about stuff, you know, that, the, that Catholics believe this or evangelicals believe this or Jews believe this. But the differences within religious groups are much starker than the differences between the religious and the irreligious. And what one of the things that's so cool about Squirrel Hill is the, the, the integrated nature of Jewish life, that Orthodox Jews are friends with secular Jews and Reform and conservative Jews hang out with sort of New Age, mystical Jewish renewal Jews as it's called. And yeah, and, and the thing that, that everyone's on their journey, right? So you talked about um, Robert Zacharias, who's this kind of, you know, liberal, uh, you know, um, kind of crunchy guy, teaches robotics at um, Carnegie Mellon. He's in his 30s and not particularly religious and afterwards decides, you know what? Like he goes to the vigil that night that's being held by teenagers, a bunch of teenagers from Taylor Alderdice High School. And I talked to them as well and they were amazing. They sit around the Starbucks table the afternoon after the shooting. So like the bodies are still in the building. It's 1 and 2 p.m. The bodies have been in there since 10 to 11 a.m. and they were all killed. And they sit around the Starbucks and they say, you have to do something. And they say, let's have a vigil tonight. Um, Saturday night, the, the end of the Sabbath, you have a, a candle lighting ritual called Havdalah. They say, let's get Havdalah candles We'll go to the corner of Forbes and Murray in front of Sixth Presbyterian Church, which of course was Mr. Rogers Church, because literally Fred Rogers was from Squirrel Hill. And so Mr. Rogers' neighborhood 
is based on Squirrel Hill. America's idea of a neighborhood comes from this neighborhood. They say, let's sit at this Starbucks at the corner on Forbes Avenue and we'll have this vigil, we plan this vigil for that night at the corner of Forbes and Murray, and we'll just light candles and sing songs. And they get a song leader with a guitar and they get candles and they do this. Cross town, meanwhile, this guy, Robert Zacharias, who's in his 30s, says, I'll go, I hear there's a vigil tonight. Before he goes, he thinks I should put on a yarmulke because it seems like a Jewy event. Uh, I've used Jewy as a compliment, by the mm -hmm. way. Some people are freaked out by the term Jewy. And so he reaches deep into his drawer where maybe there's a yarmulke from some old bar mitzvah of a nephew or something, puts on a yarmulke. After the event, he leaves the yarmulke on to go to some party that night and drink beer with friends. He puts it on the next day. He keeps wearing it. Meanwhile, across town, a woman named Lynn Hyde, who's married to a Jewish yes. guy, but had no plans to convert. Here's the sirens going past on the way to Tree of Life. Doesn't know what's happened. Discovers a few hours later that 11 people have been killed. And within you know a couple of weeks, she's decided to convert to Judaism because she says, look, my, my husband's family is Jewish. We go to synagogue sometimes. That could have been us at a different synagogue where we go. I need to be all in with this community. Um, I just want to, I just want to I just want to yeah. pause because there's this amazing Please. term which I had not known that you introduced in connection with her. I, once again, I may say it wrong. Gertoshav, uh, she before she's all in, she's this other thing, right? This yeah. kind of almost state of what child development uh, I, people call parallel play. I love that you brought this up, right? Because there's so many people listening right now who are sort of allies to Jews, are married to Jews. And, and maybe thought about converting or, or they kind of seem Jewish in their cultural and social life. There used to be a term for this, ger toshav. It basically means a righteous Gentile. It's like, you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, but you're down with us. And rabbis used to talk about that as a separate status. It's a Gentile who basically goes along with the Jewish community. So anyway, you've got all these people in this crazy mix and you've got the people whose first reaction is, I'm gonna bring out the therapy dogs. Like I have a great golden retriever. Retriever, people are gonna wanna hug a dog in a time after this. So you end up with like, cats and dogs, Jews of all kinds, everyone coming out into the streets. And it's it's kind of a beautiful thing because, and ultimately this is not a sad book, right? That's why this is a hopeful story. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I don't know, there's so much I want to talk about in so little time. I, I guess we should talk a little bit because it's it's a kind of a nexus in the book. Uh, at a certain point, President Trump uh, kind of visit, he visits and he kind of tests all of the things that you've just been talking about, the elasticity of the neighborhood, because, yes, it's a neighborhood with people who believe different things. There are Trump supporters. There's a rabbi who's not necessarily a Trump supporter, but doesn't think it would be a particularly Jewish thing to do to, to be inhospitable to a visiting president. There are people, once again, navigating and negotiating this difficult moment in their own very specific and personal ways. Uh, you talk more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, Trump basically the night after the shooting, so the shooting happens on a Saturday in October. Trump Trump is traveling somewhere. I think he's in Tennessee. And at a press conference that night, well, Trump never really had press conferences, but he he took questions on the tarmac. And he said something like, well, I'm going to Pittsburgh. Um, now, keep in mind, right, whatever you think of Trump, we can all acknowledge that in normal times, we would expect the president to go to the site of a mass killing, right? That's what presidents do. And if there were a mass killing of Muslims or Sikhs or something, and Joe Biden didn't go, there would be tremendous criticism that he didn't go. So Trump's doing the thing that in normal times we expect presidents to do. But as you know, Donald Trump was not a normal president in all sorts of ways. And it sparks a lot of outrage, especially from people who think that Trump's coziness, as they see it, with white nationalists and white supremacists helped fuel the kind of rage that this killer, the alleged killer, was giving, you know, voice to or giving bullets to. So they felt like it was particularly uh, unappealing for Trump to come. And then to come on the day that the first funerals were held, the funerals were held on Tuesday through Friday, 11 people being buried. So the whole neighborhood has taken over with mourning, you know, hearses, funeral processions, people sitting Shiva in their houses, and Trump comes in in the midst of it all. So, yeah, I mean, the, at the heart of it all is this Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, who is kind of near the end of his career. He's in his 60s. He gets, he's had several other pulpits. He's lost some jobs when synagogues have merged or gone under, and he kind of lands in Pittsburgh. It's, it's probably thought to be a soft landing, like he'll re serve out his years. And then within a year in this new job, he's the rabbi at the synagogue that suffered the worst anti-Semitic attack, attack ever. And then he has half his community saying, of course, you have to welcome the president. The president's coming. That's what you do. And the other half saying, don't you dare welcome the president. <laughs> and he ultimately comes down on the side of, you know, my job is to welcome anybody who wants to talk to me. That's what clergy do. And he does meet with the president and the president comes in, comes to town. It's sort of like a whirlwind, visits some people in the hospital and leaves with sort of all this just kind of pain and anger in his wake. 
Right. There's, I mean, once again, your storytelling is really formidable here. And so we hear the stories of liberal activists uh, who, who wanted to protest him. We hear about an Orthodox Jewish matchmaker who's kind of a Trump supporter, not kind of a Trump supporter, and who rides around on, on, her, on, on yeah. her bicycle, t- basically trolling uh, Trump protesters and, and actually yep. makes some kind of interesting points uh, in the course of doing that. We, uh, we meet a, a sociologist who really intentionally gets uh, arrested after kind of an initial loss of nerve. I mean, all these these are just kind of amazing, uh, amazing stories. Uh, you know, I think one of the things I want to do before we run out of time is, um, and it'll kind of bridge to our the other book we're talking about, uh, Rebecca Frankel, the author of that book, wrote uh, in a piece in the New York Times, which I'm sure you saw because you read everything. Mm-hmm. She says, we are uh, at a moment of particular urgency. We are at the precipice of losing the last generation of Holocaust survivors and with them our living memory uh, of that time. Right-wing governments in Eastern Europe, where much of this history took place, are working not just to undermine, but to re write the story of how the Holocaust unfolded there. Your book is also about a moment of particular urgency. And, you know, I live on the north side of West Hartford. So, uh, I mean, I drive by Young Israel, uh, one of the congregations yep. there every day. Uh, and, and I all the time drive by people who are traditionally dressed, walking to their services. And, and I do remember 2018 when suddenly there were cop cars, you know, as a precautionary me- measure, there'd be a police SUV. And, and that kind of comes and goes to too, I think, depending on the threat level, too. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see this as a time of urgency. I know there's a lot of celebration ah. and healing in your book, but yeah. talk about the urgency. Well, I mean, here's the thing about anti-Semitism, right? It's the, it is literally the best of times and the worst of times, right? If you are, um, if you are a Jew, an Ashkenazi Jew who passes as white, which I do, right? And you walk down the street and you don't have traditional garb in any way, um, and if you happen to not be coming or going from any Jewish institution, you're not leaving your JCC or dropping your kids off at Hebrew school, you're not doing anything Jewy, then you are not likely to be the victim of anti-Semitism in any way, shape, or form, okay? Which is to say the old anti-Semitism that you remember from the 50s or 60s, the gentleman's agreement anti-Semitism. Um, I don't mean to make you older than you are, but you'll remember it goes a no, little bit- I'm pretty old. A little bit farther back than me, right? The, the gentleman's agreement anti-Semitism that means that when my father started at Yale in 1963, um, it was 10% Jewish and never anymore because of the quotas. That doesn't exist anymore. Just doesn't. I, you know, if anyone knows of a law firm that still doesn't have Jewish partners because of prejudice or a country club that still is blackballing Jews, please tell me. I want to write an article about it. <laughs> but I've been doing this. I've been in this game a while now. I'm 47. And I just haven't heard those stories. I think that's gone from America or 99.9% gone. So in that sense, if you want to walk around passing as white and non-Jewish and non-ethnic and just be free of anti-Semitism, the, the, America is your oyster to pick a, a, a food that traditional Jews wouldn't eat. So if, however, you 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 look Jewish in any way, whether it's because of your attire or because you're doing something in a Jewish space, synagogue, Hebrew school, Jewish community center, um, film festival, Jew, you know, Israeli film festival somewhere, then these are not the best of times. Then we've had rising anti-Semitism. We've had rising attacks on Jews. Um, Jews are the most, li- the religious minority most likely to be the victim of hate crimes, according to the FBI statistics. Um, but that's only an issue if you are in some way putting yourself out there recognizably as a Jew, which most Jews don't. So what we have is increasingly two worlds. We have a world of people who are nominally or ethnically Jewish. Maybe they're also proud to be Jewish, but the anti-Semites will never find them. And then you have a world of Jews whom the anti-Semites can find. And for them, it's a pretty scary time. We're going to have to stop there. But the book is terrific. Uh, Go to the Odyssey Bookstore tonight uh, if you're anywhere near uh, that location. Uh, Otherwise, just get the book. I mean, when I say we scratch the surface, that's almost an overstatement. uh, There's so much here in this book. And I would happily talk with you more about it on some other occasion, Mark Oppenheimer, because I really do think this is a a landmark piece of writing. And you know how how grudgingly I hand out praise to you. uh, (laughs) So it pains me. Uh, All right. We're going to take a break. The book, once again, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting in the Soul of a Neighborhood by Mark Oppenheimer. When we come back, we'll go back into the past and then move a little bit forward towards the present. In the desert sun, halfway to Jerusalem, and we shall all be called as witnesses, each and every one. Stand 
All right. Uh, it's time for me to thank Kat Pastor, the technical producer of this show today and ideally every day. Uh, Betsy Kaplan, our former senior producer. Now, senior producer emeritus, I think that's going to be her new title, uh, is the person who produced this particular episode. And thanks very much to her as well. Uh, I, I think Betsy Kaplan and I are both thinking that we should have done two one-hour shows, one about each book. Uh, but we have to live with the decision we made right now. So joining us is Rebecca Frankel, a journalist and author. Her work has appeared in the Smithsonian Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, among other publications, and her recent, most recent book is Into the Forest, a Holocaust story of survival, triumph, and love. Um, thanks very much for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So I want to begin with sort of cold, hard numbers, although that's not really the story at all. But uh, as I understand it, uh, there were in this a Polish village, a, a Polish village that also had overtones and maybe even periods of time of being maybe part of Lithuania, maybe part of Belarus. It seems like even its geography is a, a little bit muddled at times. But there were, I think, at the beginning of this story, 4,500 Jews in this town of Zhetl, uh when the war began. Uh, and uh, in April of 1942, the Germans killed nearly 1,000 of those Jews in a single day. Four months later, uh, they uh, killed uh, another 3,000. Uh, but an, another part of them fled into the forest. And I think it was, Rebecca, 800 of them roughly got into the forest? Roughly. Yeah. That's, that's from survivor testimony. I think that that's the uh, agreed upon number. And only 200 were able to emerge at the, at the end of, of the war. Those are the cold, hard numbers, but that's not really what this story is. Tell, tell us what this story is to you. We should say it is bracketed by weddings, a wedding at the beginning and a wedding at the end. Weddings are very hopeful uh, events, uh, hence the words triumph and love in your subtitle. Yes, absolutely. Um, really, to me, this is a story ab about a family, first and foremost, the Rabinowitz family, who were from the small town you mentioned, Zhetl in Yiddish, as it's known to the survivors um, and the generations of, of survivors that have that come after them. And really, they were, uh, like any other very happy family, uh, doing well for themselves in the early 1930s in this part of Poland. Um, Morris and Miriam, they had two young daughters who are for most of the book called Rochel and Tanya. And he was a lumber dealer. She owned a small pharmacy in the town. And, you know, for them, being Jewish was not uh, really a hindrance. It was a, a town that, you know, as we're talking about these communities that have elasticity to them, this was a, a majority Jewish town, and they had really great relations for the most part with their Gentile neighbors and the neighbors in the surrounding area, which was near a forest. So they were sort of rural adjacent, which ended up being a tremendous advantage to them when the time came um, after the Nazis invaded. Right. I mean, advantage being, I think, kind of a relative term. I mean, we, right. are, talk we are talking about sort of risking uh, a pretty high chance of of dying, of being obliterated by the weather conditions, the hunger, and the, just the kind of unstable situation out in the woods uh, against certain obliteration in the, at the hands of the Nazis. Absolutely. And for so many of the, the Jews in this town, but also in the towns that surrounded it, you know, for hundreds of square miles around it and these little shadow communities, the forest was the only place for them to run to. And when you talk about giving hope, yes, of course, it, it, it wasn't the most hopeful, um, but it really was the only place for them to go if they were, you know, there was even a chance for them to make it. That was where they pinned their, their hopes because, of course, at the time, uh, there were partisan fighters who were gathering in the woods and sort of, you know, in the early part of um, 1942, uh, they were mounting very small defenses and eventually those numbers and their uh, abilities to sort of uh, beat back the Nazi forces and their collaborators increased over time. But in the summer of 1942, when the Rabinowitz family made their escape, um, yes, you're right, the, the odds did not look good. The, um, and we should say that uh, Jews in this town, they, they knew what was coming. They prepared for it as best they could. They built tunnels. They even built kind of decoy things that looked like the place they, the Nazis could find and think they'd found the hiding place, whereas the hiding place was in another place. But this is also incredibly precarious. Literally, the cough of a grandfather could give the whole thing away. Oh, I, I mean, in their... And in researching this book, you know, I, I certainly relied very heavily upon the living memory 
of the pe the members of the family who are still with us. And that's Rahul, who's now Ruth, and Tanya, who's now Toby. Um, but, you know, in getting a fuller picture of what was happening in their community and, and the community of Jettel, the community of the Jettel ghetto, and then, of course, later on in the forest, you know, I, I watched and read and found as much related Holocaust testimony as I could. And for all of the people who managed to get into a hiding place, and, and that was fewer people, certainly, um, than, <laughs> than we all would have hoped. Um, absolutely, it, it was moment to moment. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy. And it certainly, you know, it, some of it had to do with planning, and some of it had to do with just fortune, complete circumstances. You know, in one episode for the family, they're hiding in a field, uh, they're on their way to the forest and a dog comes along and there's, you know, people around. The dog could certainly alert uh, them to their presence. And another wagon comes by just at the right moment. The dog goes off and chases the wagon and they're safe again. But it, it's just those little turns of fate, really. So there's um, uh, this family of four, but there's uh, another person that's really important to talk about, particularly from where I'm sitting, uh, mm -hmm. which is in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and and really in many respects the story that, as I understand it from your book, launched you in this direction. Uh, and that is a little boy at the time named Philip Lazowski, um, who – uh, is saved, there's this harrowing process called selection in which the Nazis basically uh, assign uh, every Jew in line either to death or at least temporarily to a little bit more life. Uh, and, and he is saved during this process. I don't know if you want to uh, sketch out that yeah. story a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, this this happened, the liquidation of these ghettos happened in phases because it was valuable to them to keep workers around um, and so in April of 1942, the first selection in Jettel happens and Miriam is separated from her husband, Morris, but she's with her two young daughters, Rachel and Tanya. And while they're waiting in line, and it is very much a brutal scene, you know, people are being killed around them. They're being dragged away from their family members. It becomes very clear to all of the people there what's actually happening. You know, they're pulling away elderly, they're pulling away people who are infirm, women without work certificates, and children who are on their own. And then this is where Philip Lazowski finds himself without any help or recourse. He is also separated from his family, and he's approaching people in line on their way to this, uh, the end point of this election where their fates are determined. And people who knew him and people are turning him away left and right. And then ahead of him, he sees this woman with a kind looking face. And she's with her two young daughters and she has a work certificate and he approaches her and asks her to please pretend that he's her son. And, you know, she takes a look at him and she says, um, if the Nazis let me live with two children, they'll let me live with three. And so on they, they go and they make it through the line and he makes it all along with her. And as an 11 year old boy, um, he doesn't think to ask for her name, but eventually discovers it. And that will be a very important detail in his life as he moves on. Um, right. And and we should say that, I mean, he actually does get back to some of his family members and he gets and does his own escape, which involves mm -hmm. he's a boy who jumps out of a two story window uh, and, and lands pretty safely. This is another one of these kind of narrow escapes. There's another boy who does the same thing who's right next to him. There's an SS guard who seems to be looking right at them and then turns his back as if to say, that's not going to be my job today is to kill these two little boys. So, um uh, we should just say that obviously Rabbi Philip Luzowski here in this area cast a very, very large profile uh, and has um, told his story not only in a book but on our sibling show, uh, Where We Live, and I invite people to kind of track that down. But but yes, there's this incredible connection, right? There's this connect. I don't yes. know. Is, was it a spoiler to say what happens? Or I mean, how do you No, handle I don't think so. Because I think even even in knowing it, I, you know, there's certainly more to it. And it's it's worth investigating further, in my opinion. But um, what eventually happens is that uh, the Rabinowitz family, so Morris and Miriam and their two daughters, and uh, Philip Lazowski, who becomes Rabbi Lazowski, uh, they have their own uh, harrowing journeys uh, through the war and afterwards, but eventually both families uh, 
end up in the United States. And in 1953, Philip Lazowski, now a young man attending multiple universities and working very hard to make his way in this new country, attends a wedding. And at the wedding, he sits down next to a young girl about his age and they start talking and they discover that they're both from small towns in Poland. And he says that he's from the town of Belitsa. And she says, oh, I know a woman who saved a boy from Belitsa. And he says, well, tell me about this woman. Tell me the story. And then he sits there and he listens to his own story. And this woman is friends with Rahul or Ruth and Miriam's daughter. And from there, Philip reconnects with the woman who saved him, Mary Rabinowitz, and he makes his way to Hartford, Connecticut to visit them. And while he's there at their house on Kent Street, um, he engages the older daughter, uh, who is now called Ruth, and they start writing letters. And eventually this leads to a romance uh, blossoming in the Catskills. And then finally, the, the last wedding of the book that you referenced earlier comes to pass. So, you know, this is, in many respects, uh, the, particularly this whole story uh, of people trying to s- survive in the Lipachonska forest, it's a pretty stark and disturbing story. There are newborn babies who are not allowed to live because they're endangering uh, uh, other people. There are women worried about being raped, sometimes choosing an alliance w- with a strong man rather than subject themselves to that. There are it's just incredible stories of hunger and betrayal and people stealing food from one another and all the things that people do when their lives are absolutely knocked down to the narrowest possible margin between life and death. So, and, and yet, I think despite all that, you see this, uh, particularly in the way that it ends, as a story of triumph uh, and love. So say more about that. I mean, how do you square that really horrible earlier reality from 42 to 44 with, you know, where it comes out? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, in in encountering and engaging in so many of these stories in order to brought in my own perspective of what happened to this one family. Um, This, of course, was not the case for every person or every family that managed to stay intact or managed to survive the same circumstances, whether it was, you know, the Holocaust of concentration camps or was the Holocaust of bullets and um, these massacres that happened in these smaller villages. Um, You know, I, I think that for a lot of people, the experience broke them spiritually, emotionally, some physically. Um, and then there were some like Morris and Miriam Rabinowitz who, for whatever reason, perhaps there was the strength of their marriage um, certainly played a part of it and the love that they had for each other um, that helped them weather this in a, in a different way and to have them emerge more fully intact as their you know, former selves, that it didn't break their marriage, it didn't break their spirits. Um, but I think that it's important to look to these stories now, not just to preserve them, but to see them as examples that it, they really encountered the worst of what humanity um, has and the, the balancing scales. And then they also managed to come through, I think, in, in what is the best of, you know, the human condition and, and what people can do for each other, because certainly their um, their fortitude wasn't just spent only on themselves. It wasn't just spent only on their daughters, but of the other people who were with them in the forest. Some of them were family members and some of them were just became part of their forest community. So, you know, I've been saying this a little bit uh, more now that I'm, I'm talking about the book, but um I hope there are more Miriams out there in the world. Um, And if anyone reading the book gets to know them, uh, you know, know their story and and know what kind of people they were at sort of the worst of times, um, I think the better off for all of us. So speaking of people reading the book or knowing about the book, um, this book is exhaustively researched. Uh, On the other hand, you couldn't find all the kinds of people that you wanted to find, relatives of other people uh, who had been in the forest. And my understanding is since the book came out, you are hearing from a whole bunch of other people. Uh, how's that experience been? That's, and thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that's been one of the most rewarding parts of the after, you know, the book coming out into the world. 
Um, Jettel is a, a very, very tiny place, and it was very difficult to find information out about this town. Um, it's not like you can just go to the library, <laughs> find three volumes on the history of history of the town. Uh, and so a lot of it was through personal testimony. Um, but when I went to try and find people, the testimonies, especially through the Shawan Foundation, were mostly uh, recorded in the early and mid 1990s. And, you know, I could trace people only so far. And so now that the book is out in the world and the New York Times piece that you quoted earlier, I've been hearing from not only just the uh, family members of survivors, the sons or daughters or nieces, nephews or grandchildren, but actually from a few of the survivors who I wrote about um, in the book themselves have somehow found it, you know, through social media or um, just through their Jewish communities or um, I don't know, just being at the library or something, and they've they've reached out, and it's it's really remarkable to hear from them because it really was very much a small town, and I know a lot of these connections between the families. I, I wrote about them, but you know, to to think that they can potentially be reestablished now, and hopefully we're going to have a, a Jettel reunion <laughs> on Zoom at some point in the future, and connect um, and connect these people again, which would be great. So we only have about two and a half minutes left. And if I was, were better at symmetry, having quoted you to Oppie, I would quote Oppie to you. But I think I'm just going to quote you to you uh, oh. with, the, with, with the same quote. I mean, you talk about a moment of per- particular urgency. And, and I, I'd sort of like you to sort of maybe spend the last little bit of time talking about that, how you see this story uh, when you lean it up against the present moment. Huh. Well, I think that there are a couple of ways to look at it. And, you know, when I was writing that article, the urgency I was mostly referring to was just the fact that we are going to be, you know, losing our, our living Holocaust survivors that, you know, in the next few years, in the next decade, they just won't be around anymore. And so there is that urgency to preserve as much as we can of this history while they're still here. Um, you know, I would not have been able to write this book uh, just based on testimony alone. I needed, you know, Ruth and Toby, you know, the Rabinowitz daughters. I had so many questions and it wasn't just a matter of doing one interview or two interviews. We did hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> conversations for context for, you know, just to sort of uh, get all of the facts and the details down correctly. Um, but then in the other sense, that, that doesn't actually have to do very much with our living Holocaust survivors or losing that generation of people. Um, it has to do with preserving the history that they've left us. And I, you know, have to say that, you know, to in part of what Mark was saying about there's a generation of, you know, uh, Jews out there who won't be identified or who aren't going to be persecuted based on what they look like, you know, that history doesn't sort of fall under that same um, generalization or those same distinguishing features. And to read or to hear about what's happening in Poland in terms of, you know, trying to uh, whitewash the history of the complicity in that country, or even just to hear that in the United States and our education systems that, uh, you know, to read uh, some of the articles that I've been seeing lately, um, the school in South Lake, for example, uh, Texas, uh, where there's this idea that there's an alternative history mm-hmm. to the Holocaust. Yeah, that people should end. be should be reading a counter counter narrative to the Holocaust, and I think that is all connected with whether people are still alive who can who can personally contradict that. Uh, where we live, our sibling show just did an episode about that as well. We have to stop. I am so sorry because there's so much more to say about Into the Forest, a Holocaust story of survival, triumph, and love by Rebecca Frankel. You will just have to get the book. <laughs> <laughs> 